Hampton Church. How are we doing today? Good. You look great. You sound great. I hope you're feeling great. Today is a fantastic day to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and uh, just really glad that you're here to do that along with us. Uh, Join with me, if you would, in prayer, and we'll ask for uh, God to work in this time uniquely. Father, we're thankful for uh, the opportunity to sing, to celebrate, and uniquely, I would pray for uh, each person that came here this morning, that you would do a unique work in their heart. I believe uh, with certainty that they're here for a reason. It's not by uh, chance. It's not by accident, but it's because uh, you want to say something to them. You want to do something in their life. And so we ask that you would do just that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to start by acknowledging something important this morning, uh, and it's this. It's, you know, this is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I want to acknowledge that a person, a human being dying and coming back to life is, it's not only highly illogical, but it's also irrational. You with me on that one? Okay. Uh, it, it certainly is not ordinary. There's no way... Uh, under any, any uh, scope of thinking whatsoever that you could say it's ordinary. And even to say that it's extraordinary doesn't even quite fit. It's, a, it's an understatement of the idea. And you might not know this, but the idea of a resurrection was uh, just as inconceivable for people 2,000 years ago as it is for people today. It wasn't something that they would have naturally been inclined to believe. And people living under the time of Jesus... Uh, found it to be just as irrational as you and I do. Uh, Even though Jesus said he would die and come back to life, it was such a strange concept that the idea was so inconceivable that the people who heard Jesus say, I'm going to die and come back to life, didn't understand what he meant when he said that. Uh, when his lifeless body was taken off of the cross, Jesus had been crucified, and when his, when his body was taken down and when they put his body into a tomb, everybody just assumed it's done. It's over. Let's go home. It's a sad day. It's done. People did not uh, conceive of this idea of the resurrection, and nobody certainly expected to see him again, certainly not alive. It, To take it a step further, in fact, after his resurrection, one of his closest friends, after Jesus had come uh, back from the grave and had come from the tomb, people saw him and people began to say, we saw him. And one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his followers, didn't believe it, even after his friends told him that that was true. And he said, I'm not going to believe it, I can't believe it until I see him face to face and until I touch him with my own hands, I'm not going to believe it. It is because a person dying and coming back to life is not just unusual, it is illogical, it's irrational, it is inconceivable, and that's precisely why some of you here today have chosen not to believe in it. But here's my, here's my encouragement for you this morning, and it's, it's this. Uh, just because it doesn't happen doesn't mean it didn't happen. Just because it doesn't happen doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I want to speak for just a moment to those of you in the room who are skeptics. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and I would encourage you to consider the words of uh, N.T. Wright. He's the senior research fellow at Oxford University, and he is way smarter than I am. But I appreciate what he has to say about the resurrection, because uh, what he says is the, that if you are a skeptic, you cannot simply dismiss the resurrection. You, you quite the contrary, have to consider all of the facts and the evidence surrounding the resurrection And those facts, the evidence surrounding the resurrection, they demand an explanation. And so if you're a historian, if you're a a scientific thinker, whatever form your skepticism comes, it demands that that you not quickly dismiss it, but that you give it some considerable thought. Here's here's what N.T. Wright says specifically. He says, you can't just say, I don't believe it. It's not true. When something turns up that doesn't fit the paradigm you're working with, one option is to change the paradigm. And a failure to provide a historically plausible alternative explanation is not being more scientific, 
it is being less so. And so what N.T. Wright is getting at is it's not, it's not enough to simply di- dismiss the resurrection and say it couldn't have happened. You have to, you have to be able to, ki- to give a, an intelligent answer to all of the events surrounding the resurrection. Specifically, just because it, it doesn't happen doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And so you have to maybe adjust your paradigm. There are some very compelling questions that you have to give an answer to. You have to give an alternative explanation to. Let me give you several of them. First one is this. How did so many prophecies that were given about the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus hundreds of years before the life of Jesus, how did they come to fulfillment with such accuracy and precision? How does that happen? What is your, what is your answer to that? Uh, what transformed a group of very cowardly disciples into, into men and women who were courageous and confident. You may know the story, you might not, but one of them was Peter. When Jesus was being arrested before he was crucified, people said, hey, Peter, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And he says, not me. And somewhat famously, he did that three times. Not me, not me, not me. You got the wrong guy. How do you take, how, do, how does a group of people who are hesitant and who are somewhat uh, scared and fearful turn into people who are confident and courageous. Yeah, courageous. You have to give an answer to that. Why did, why did in that first century Christianity emerge so, so far and so wide and so fast? Why did, it, why did it with such dynamic power spread to the far reaches of the known world? What happened that made that happen? You have to come up with a... a, a a rational reason for that. How do you account for hundreds of eyewitnesses who personally said, we saw Jesus living after he died? And they maintained that testimony for decades after the resurrection. How do you account for that? Uh, why would so many women who were, who, who were definitively living with a particular set of values, who were living in a particular culture, completely shift and adjust to a new culture, to a new way of living. People who were, who were previously bent on revenge and hatred becoming forgiving and kind. What happened to them? People who were largely self-centered and selfish becoming uh, extravagantly generous. What, what was the impetus that created that in their lives? What happened in, in, in the lives of thousands of people to where they, they fundamentally changed? I don't know if, if you can think through what would need to happen in your life to completely change the entire direction of how you live, but it, has, it would have to be something significant. It happened to them. What's the reason? Why did so many, one more question, why did so many people under under threat and the very real danger of persecution and even death, maintain their testimony that Jesus is alive. Why is it that so many people, and I don't know what what it would take for you, but for them, the Roman government persecuting Christians said, if you continue to state that Jesus is still living, you need to understand that the penalty for that belief, the penalty for you making that statement is going to be death. Not just death, but Death by being boiled in oil. Death by being burned alive on a stake. Death by beheading. Death by crucifixion. How do you account for the thousands of people when, when facing not only persecution but death itself said, if you continue to maintain your, your testimony, professing your belief that Jesus is living, You understand that we're going to kill you. And they said, Jesus is alive. And so it's not just enough to dismiss the events of the resurrection. Uh, You have to to give some thoughtful consideration to it, as N.T. Wright says. And perhaps even that some of you here today, the, the reason that you're not yet a follower of Christ, or perhaps the reason that you haven't believed and trusted in the work of Christ and his resurrection is because you haven't thought about it enough. Maybe you need to give it some more consideration. And instead of quickly dismissing it, you need to dive into it and and scrutinize it and hold it to the test that it deserves. Here's something else that I've found. 
when I listen to people and hear their objections about Christianity, which I, which I try to sincerely listen to, I try to listen to people's concerns, I try to listen to their hesitations, I have some very good, honest dialogues with people, I, I try to sincerely listen, and, and what I find is that not only, not only have many people not given the events or the, the historical evidence of the resurrection enough, enough focus or enough scrutiny, and I would encourage that, as I said, but what I've also found is when I listen to people is that many of them have chosen not to become a Christian because of what, have, what I would deem as lesser issues. Lesser issues. Uh, and and here's, the, here's the truth. If you dig around Christianity enough, if, you, if you're going to poke your head around enough corners or if you open up enough boxes and dig around, let me just be perfectly honest with you, you're going to find some weird stuff. <laughs> you are. You're going to come across some stuff that's, that's like a head scratcher. Uh, you're going to find issues that are that are confusing, some that are confounding. You're going to place, you're going to, you're going to find all kinds of whys and hows, and frankly, many of those things do not have very good answers. Some of them have no answer that I know of. But my encouragement for you today is that you would not choose to dismiss trusting in the work of Christ because of lesser issues. And let me give you some encouragement. Here's why I think that's okay. Uh, I want to share with you some thoughts from a guy named the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was a, a person who did not like Christianity when it first started. In fact, he persecuted Christians and was even responsible for some of them dying until he had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. And so Paul went from being a, I don't like Christianity, I hate Christianity, I'm going to kill Christians, to being a Christian himself. And so he wrote a letter to a group of Christians who were living in a city, and that letter is found in the New Testament, one of many letters that he wrote. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, and I think this very helpfully speaks to those of you who may be, again, your skeptics because of the, the whys and the hows in those lesser issues. And listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says, For I delivered, and this is Paul speaking as he uh, writes this letter, For I delivered to you as of first importance, we'll come back to that, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That's another way of saying they've died, they've passed on. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. I want you to notice what, what Paul describes about belief about the, the events surrounding the resurrection. You may have... You may have uh, yeah, so he says it's of first importance. Why is, that, why is that important? Why is first importance important? I believe that it's important because what, what Paul is saying is this is foundational. This is fundamental. If you're going to assess Christianity, if you're going to think about Christianity, then the very fundamental belief is that Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, and Christ rose on the third day. That is first importance. Christ died for our sins. If you don't know this, the Bible tells us that humanity, we are sinners. We do things that, that we just get off course on God's good and perfect will for our lives. If you're unaware of those things in your life, ask somebody that knows you well. They will be happy to fill you in. <laughs> I'm sure that you have things in your life that are that are minor regrets, you have things in your life that are significant regrets. You have things that you know you shouldn't have done that you did, things that you wish that you would have said that you didn't. You know, I know, I'm painfully aware of the things in my life that's just not good. The list of my own life is long, and I'm guessing that it's long for you. The Bible calls those things sin. Sin, wrongdoing, demands justice. I'm guessing all of you want to live in a society where there's justice, you don't like for people to do wrong things and not get away with it? 
Justice is great for other people. We don't like it as much for ourselves. But we know that, that the only good world is a world of justice. And so when people do things that are wrong, a fair society, a culture can only function if, if there is consequences for wrongdoing. Otherwise, it's anarchy and chaos. And so we understand the concept of justice. And, and that's because it's a, it's a reality of, of life the way God intended it to be. And so we deviate from God's goodwill. The Bible calls that sin. Our sin demands justice. And so understanding that, the story of the Bible is that Christ chose to die for our sins. He lived the life that, he, that we should have lived, and then he died the death that we should have died. And so the picture of the crucifixion is Christ dying, paying the penalty for our sins, sufficiently doing that, going into the grave three days later, coming back from the dead as a demonstration that he did indeed sufficiently pay for the penalty of our sins, raised on the three, third day. Paul says, first importance, Christ died, Christ was buried, and he was raised on the third day. First importance. Now, here, here's, here's where I go with that. If, if Paul says, and I agree with him, that that is of first importance, then what that means is there are things that are second important, third important, Fourth, fifth, sixth, important, all the way down to like not even important. Doesn't even matter. And my encouragement for you this morning is that if you are here today, because many Christians, and maybe some of you, have chosen not to be Christians because of things that are of lesser importance. And as I told you, if you dig around enough, you're going to find some weird, wonky, crazy stuff. You're going to you're going to find stuff that you're going to go, boy, that doesn't make any sense. And I would just encourage you, let that be less important and consider what is of first importance. Consider, consider the nature and the solution. If you truly are a sinner, is there justice in, in creation? And if so, what is justice for your wrongdoing? And, and what is the compelling evidence of the resurrection? Don't let the other things. Yes, you're going to come across Christians who don't act like Christ. And I'm sorry for that. I would say that's probably like third or fourth importance. It's important. But don't let that keep you from making a decision about that which is of first importance. You might read through the Bible and go, man, that's, that's some crazy stuff. Well, I get it. There's some crazy stuff. Don't let those lesser important things keep you from the thing that is of first importance. That Christ died for our sins and that Christ was buried and Christ rose again from the grave. Just as important as maybe, and, that, and that's, what, that's what N.T. Wright is talking about. He's talking about a different paradigm. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, as I said, it's illogical, it's irrational, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't happen every day. It's why it's miraculous. But just because it doesn't happen doesn't mean it didn't happen. That's of first importance. Some of you don't know me, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'm Donovan, by the way, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> I am a skeptic. Uh, I am a natural skeptic. And I, and I am the kind of person who doesn't easily believe things. I have been a Christian for 34 years. And in my spiritual journey, there have been moments where I have encountered things in the scope of Christianity that, that for me, I thought, man, that's, that's some wonky stuff right there. And I've wrestled. There have been a couple of times in my spiritual journey over the last few decades where I would say I had a crisis of faith. Do I believe this thing is true? Do I believe this thing is real? And I can tell you what, what I come back to, and it would be my encouragement for you today. What I come back to is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Because there are going to be all kinds of things, the whys and the hows, that, that perhaps don't make sense. But for me, what I come back to is what matters most, and that is, did Christ die for our sins? Was he buried? And did he rise from the grave? And for me, personally, I believe that it holds up to the scrutiny. I believe that you can apply, uh, yes, you, you need to function from a different paradigm, 
but it, but it holds up to the weight of the evidence and those questions that I've asked. Just as important, I can tell you this. And so that maybe speaks to the mind issue. Let me speak to the heart issue. You cannot deny that 2,000 years ago, immediately after the events of the resurrection, that thousands of people had their lives significantly trans- transformed by the story of Jesus. You can't deny it. You can't deny the, the impact that, that happened in people's lives. And what you can't deny is over the last 2,000 years, the continued transforming impact of the power of the resurrection. And so, yes, I can appeal to your mind and say that I think that it stands up to the scrutiny, but I would also appeal to your heart. I would appeal to you to, to the work of Christ that happened 2,000 years ago. I would appeal to you the work of Christ in my own life. You are sitting in a room filled with people whose lives have been significantly impacted by the power of the resurrection. I could, I could speak to you about knowing the, the burden of my own wrongdoing and the burden of my own sin and, and knowing the weight of that and, and feeling the forgiveness when I, when I said to Christ, I need you to, to remove the burden of my sins and I transfer those over to you, I can speak to you the power and the liberated feeling of having been forgiven. I could speak to you about the, the things in my life that were debilitating and the things that were, were very, in a very real way weighing me down and that in my own strength I could not overcome. And when I asked for the supernatural strength of Christ to empower me, I can tell you that it was the only thing that, that worked for me. I can tell you about the, the, the strangely gentle voice of God that has guided me and given me wisdom. I can tell you about the empowering that, that I've experienced to, to live in a unique way and to help me to overcome challenges and uh, uncertainty and the confidence that the very real presence of Christ has given me. And I could tell you the stories of hundreds and hundreds of people who have personally experienced the same transformative power made possible through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it, it changes lives. And so my encouragement to you this morning is, if, if, you hear, if you're here today, and I, I truly believe this, I prayed, prayed this when we started, but uh, some of you maybe thought that the reason that you're here this morning is because, uh, you know, it's habit, it's tradition, Easter Sunday, I want to be nice to my wife and go to church even though I don't want to, or my mother-in-law or whatever, that, that may be what you thought brought you here, but, but perhaps the real reason that you're here is, is because God wanted to bring you here for you to have a personal encounter with him and for you to come face to face with the reality of the resurrection and for you to maybe put aside some of the hindrances that you have that you've allowed to be an excuse for you up until this point and to finally say, I surrender and I believe. I need, I need salvation. I need forgiveness of sin. I believe in the, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to follow Jesus. The band's going to come up and we're going to close with a song. And I want to give you an opportunity to, uh, to respond this morning. And I'm going to ask that you would stand with me. For those of you who are maybe not around Expedition Church very often, you know that I don't do this much, but I wanted to do it this morning. I felt God was leading me very specifically to give you an opportunity to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. And so here's here's basically uh, how we're going to do it. Let me first say this. I, I am not a salesman. And so, so my job is not to get you to buy into something. My job isn't to get you to sign your name on a dotted line. My job is simply to be a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I, it's not my obligation to get you to do anything, but what I don't want to do is not give you an opportunity to respond. And so as the band plays, 
I'm going to ask that you would possibly do something that is the scariest thing that you've ever done in your life. Perhaps the thing that requires more, more boldness than anything that you've ever done in your life. But I'm going to ask you to do this. If God is stirring your heart in this moment, and I would, if, if you're sensing something, don't dismiss that. Don't push that aside. That's how God works. Perhaps you've never felt uh, and you've wondered, what is it like when God is moving or doing something? If you're feeling something now, listen to that. That's, that's, a, that's a sign of God working. And I want to give you an opportunity to uh, come on up here. And I, wanna, I want you to introduce yourself to me. And I want you to, to have the opportunity to come up and give your life to Jesus and say, I want to follow him. I believe, I believe in that which is of first importance. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the lesser things aside and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to put my conviction in that which I believe to be true and let this be the day of your salvation. And so if God's leading you to do that right now, come on up. The band's going to sing. Dave, you can start singing and uh, you can just meet me up here and be happy to talk with you a little bit about it. Praise the King, He is risen. Praise the King, He's alive. Praise the King, that's defeated. Hallelujah, He's alive. Don't stop because of me. Tanya, can you come on up? Yeah. Anybody else? Come on up. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Death's defeated. Hallelujah. He's alive. God's stirring your heart. Come on up. Listen to his leading. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Defeated, Hallelujah, He's alive. Oh, hallelujah, He's alive. Sing that again, praise the King. I'm not going to do a hard sell on you, but one more opportunity. Is this the day of your salvation? And let me just tell you, if you're, if you're feeling maybe your pride, maybe there's embarrassment or shame, put those things aside. You are in a room full of people who would be nothing but excited for you to discover the beauty of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so whatever thing might be playing games in your head, saying don't do it, put those things aside. Listen to the voice of God, and we'd love to pray with you this morning. Let's sing just a little bit more. Sing the grave, the grave could not ignore it, but know those heavens roaring, hell where is your feet? 
empty. Death, where is your sting? The world could not ignore it. When all the saints are rolling, Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Hey, before we leave, let me just uh, mention a few things. One, if you haven't yet gotten your picture taken, you can go out these doors right here, and uh, we have uh, all of that set up. Also, we're having a baptism in two weeks from today. If you've never been baptized, it's, it's a public declaration of having given your life to Christ, then we would encourage you to do that. You can use one of those cards that are in the back of the pew and just put your name and communion on there and put it in one of the containers on the back walls. And lastly, if you do have some questions and you maybe you want somebody to uh, have a little conversation with you, I'll just be up here, happy to talk. If you need prayer, happy to do that as well. Let me pray uh, for all of us and then we'll uh, be on with our day. God, we are so thankful for the transformative power made possible through the resurrection of your son, Jesus. And I pray that we would go out and live as people who have uh, had a personal encounter with the living God. For those this morning who may continue to be uncertain, would you give guidance and an awareness of your presence, continue to draw them into relationship with yourself. May they be reminded that you love them, that you care for them, that you are real. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate this morning. We pray all of that in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great day. Happy Easter. Mm -hmm.